last night and I've been thinking I've right. been thinking I've been yes. thinking a lot about it. So hmm. um so how would you like to proceed? What what would serve your purpose and needs? So uh, first I would like your first feedback on um this uh talk that you watched uh, you know the AI dilemma um yep. that I think came came up like late March or something um yep. and I think has become very viral and generated a lot of lot of awareness um and not that I learned like you know um uh, things that I didn't really know but I really loved how they articulated that but I like your feedback on that yep. um whatever you know breakthroughs and new thoughts or yeah, it, it created that specific piece. Um, then I'd like um, a discussion about what, how do you see uh, AI today from your perspective? And we can share our perspectives, of course, and uh, the question that it raised uh, from our very special kind of, you know, positioning in, uh, in the uh, augmented social intelligence realm, which leads to a different paradigm. And then I would also like to talk about the deaf camp like uh, do we want to bring this conversation i mean i i don't see how we would not bring it um and then how can we bring it in a generative way i think yeah. that those three things maybe you want to add another chapter also to what i proposed no that's fine that's plenty there's not even enough time for that i don't think but yes let's let's do our best because i do have um time limits today because i have other meetings and stuff mm -hmm. okay um Okay, so I can give you, I can just jump right in. So the first thing you said is feedback on the piece itself. Yeah. So I did learn things. I was not, I haven't really delved into the whole technical side of the AI stuff that's been going on, the large language models. And um, I did not recognize, I did not realize that when they were talking about large language models, they had generalized language to any expressions. Okay. Mm -hmm. I did not know that. And so it was very interesting to me to see the pieces around what was most powerful was the the um, example of the camera mixed with the Wi-Fi. Yes. Mm -hmm. That was, it, and not because of this surveillance, none of that, yeah. but because it shows yeah. the, the, the underlying truth that I've been saying for a long time about grammatic capacities run the universe. Yes. And so there's something about, oh, this that's why this works because i was like I, I felt vindicated in my intuition about grammatic capacities yes. and so i don't know what to do with that yet i'm sitting on that and thinking about that um which it actually makes me think that maybe i should go and actually try to build some of these and play around with it and get a different um experience of it i just don't have enough time because i've got so many other things to do but it makes me feel that way so that's part one part two the strongest feeling that I had about this is the, the thing that they don't seem to understand at all, that this is only a dilemma because our, our social organisms run on money. Mm -hmm. yep. if, if our social organisms didn't run on money, then, and we had a different valuation system, this would not be a dilemma. Absolutely. We would actually have the tooling to deal with it. And yeah. so they're sitting here going like, holy fuck, what are we going to do? Um, and I'm like, well, uh, I totally back in the place that the only the only thing we can do is the thing we've been trying to do from the very beginning, which is deal with, uh, move us into a post-monetary future. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know what this means to the strategics of how to get there now. Yes. Because this changes, I think it changes the strategics around that. Um, so there's that. Then the third thing was they the whole talk was deeply embedded in supremacy consciousness mm -hmm. and it was most embedded in supremacy consciousness when they got to talking about china mm -hmm. and i didn't recognize that but i thought I, the, my meeting before you was uh, with matthias and he he pointed that out i'm like oh yeah i felt really weird there and I, that was an example mm -hmm. of that mm -hmm. and so there's another piece of this that where the where supremacy consciousness is the consciousness side the monetary system is in a, the deepest embodiment of supremacy consciousness and so there's something about continuing our spiraling around embodied forms and consciousness shift outside of supremacy consciousness 
that's like, well, the answer is obvious. Now, it's obvious at this high level. It is not at all obvious about adjacent possible to me. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see if there's any other things that I can say about. Um, uh, I'll say a couple more things. I think that now this is moving on to, or this is a couple more thoughts that came from talking with Matthias about it this morning. Um, one, there's a, there's a, a, a non-negligible possibility that the internet becomes completely broken this year or next year. Mm -hmm. That the conversation that you and I are having right now, I'm not having it with you, so I don't know. I think this is part of what you were referring to, that if that if there's no assurance that I'm having this conversation with you, then the only conversations I can have are in-person conversations. Mm -hmm written or 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 video um and so that puts um some technical questions in play about whether holochain and cryptography make a difference and i'm not sure they do in terms of digital communication that's number one number two um i was thinking about their their pattern where they're saying when um when a new technology comes along, the technology requires new laws, like the right to privacy only came after the camera was invented. So it occurred to me that what might end up happening is that the law would say something like impersonating another human is um, subject to the death penalty. Like if you wanna go the whole way out there, because that becomes the biggest threat that a human is impersonated by the impersonation technology. And so I meant, I said that to, to Matthias and he goes, yeah, but there's a problem with that, which is that there's actually, as they said, there's no evidence that can't be faked. So therefore, it would be very easy to fake the fact that somebody faked you. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't even have that law. Mm -hmm. And so this is not a thing that they mentioned. But there's a way in which if that is really true, that there is no evidence that cannot, no content, because that's what they talked about, no content that cannot be generated, then the legal system becomes entirely broken. Now, it's one thing to generate digital content. It's another thing to, de to generate physical content. But all that physical content and all the content that's talked about in a court of law is mediated through words. So let's pretend that they can't do that yet. But the whole alpha persuader thing, do you remember the alpha persuader thing? It does make total sense to me that even with what they've already got, not even in the in the content creation side, but just in the curation side, the curation AIs, is that the legal team with the best alpha persuader wins, which means that it has nothing to do with truth anymore. Mm -hmm. And so that also breaks the legal system. Yep. And, and, and that we already have things about altered truth that have roots in the in the internet also, not in the same way, but uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just going to the actual function. Way. I'm going to the functioning legal system this year. I'm assuming legal teams will be using Alpha Persuader for their arguments, and they will go find out who the who the jury is, mm -hmm. and they will just say which arguments will work for this jury and use yep. those arguments. It doesn't matter anything about truth. Yep. So um, I don't know what it means when the legal system is broken that way. That the 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 person with the well here goes back to money the person with the most money can buy the most compute power for the best alpha persuader and they win mm -hmm. um and so then the final yeah i think the final thing that that comes down to is mm, this requires some investigation into how um where ai intersects with cryptography and i don't know the answer to that Mm -hmm. So there you have my, I don't know if any of that is, feels new to you or interesting, but that's what showed up for me. Thank you. Well, I, I feel very aligned with everything you, you shared. Um, when you talk about supremacy consciousness, I, I also, you know, with my own words, I talk about the pyramidal collective intelligence. And by the way, I heard one of the presenters, I, I keep forgetting their names, um, talking to the Congress and, and having this language like, you know, how we can resolve that, where well, we need more policies, we need more, we need more pyramidal intelligence to like, wow, 
he seemed like, you know, so open to uh, the, the realm and possibilities of AI and then so entrapped into the old world and the old geopolitics, you know, and all those things. <laughs> it seemed like well, some, I, some kind of level of cognitive dissonance. Like how can a, a guy of this level not even know um, the other possibilities of uh, emergence and, and, you know, distributed um, self-regulating systems, you know, and things like that? Well, I think I think he does know that, but that wasn't the purpose of this talk. Mm -hmm. Like this talk was to talk to people who are in that world. True. And this talk, or, I mean, I don't know how much Tristan or Aza, I think Tristan and Aza, I don't know. Like Arthur has spent time with Tristan, um, okay. a significant time. Like you know, I think he went and used Tristan. Okay. So, um, so they know each that. other. He, so he okay. knows about this stuff, uh, and so I don't. But I think the whole rubber band effect thing. It's like you're going to talk about AI and then you're also going to talk about our shit. Mm, probably not. You can't do both of them at the same time. And I, but I also don't know how much Tristan has really pulled that stuff in. And also, I don't know, like, right. Just giving every in like what, I don't know what the interaction is between the kind of tooling that we're talking about and this stuff. It could be worse. Yeah. Yep. It's not at all clear to me that, the things that we've been talking about actually have taken into account what happens when you have, when everybody has a golem that they can use. Yes. Yeah. And so I think part of what they're saying is that it doesn't even matter. Like this stuff is real, but, um, but we also have to deal with what is already here. We do have the government and like, they're just trying to slow something down this year. Yeah. I, there's a part of me that feels like, really, you think you're going to be able to achieve that? put your energy someplace else dude because you're not going to be at most what you're going to do is you're going to get a couple minutes of slowdown yep maybe a month yep and what does that buy you nothing um but there is a lot of conversation going on and so that's that that is really worth what they're doing i they, they did a the presentation is quite good oh yeah outstanding yes so, but from our purposes, Jeff, I, I, I don't know. I don't know how, if there's any changing of gears that I need to do. I don't even know. Like, actually, I can tell you two things that are showing up for me right now that are, have become bigger in my heart that are part of this. One is land weaving society. And two is embodied tools for sense making. Mm -hmm. And so, so uh, and I mean, yep. I know what you mean. We've had this conversation. Yep. But let's let's um, lay that down again. Yeah, you mean get it onto the recording so that it can go into a large language model so that they can thwart it? Is that what you want? <laughs> and so that an AI can learn how to overcome that. Exactly. Right. This is like thing. Okay. So actually, let me put one more insight that came because of a thing that Matthias said. Matthias was like, I don't know how to have what to even say to anybody. What is a responsible narrative? If I put anything on the internet, it will go into a lang large language model. So it will start affecting what happens. So what is a responsible statement? What kind of narratives am I creating that will actually help with where we, we need to go rather than not with every word I speak, mm -hmm. assuming that all of our words are captured by our phones and go into the la large language model. Mm -hmm. And that's equivalent to me to about lying. Like we know that lying is bad. And so you're not supposed to lie. But do we have a similar responsibility to creating um, integrous narratives all the time? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, but to the other two things. So at one of the things that is at the core of supremacy consciousness is the idea that you can own land. Yep. And that is, I am now 100% convinced, especially after reading Regenesis that I pointed you to. And I mean, I've known this all along anyways, but there's like a way in which it's landing in me that at the core of supremacy consciousness is the idea that I can own land. Mm -hmm. Therefore, at the core of changing that consciousness is land emancipation, removing the land from enslavement. Yep. Um, you say when, so you stand, when you say land... That includes um, all forms of life living on it. Remember, you talked to a vegan person, so 
No, I, I'm that trying includes, to. Uh, that includes I'm, every every form of supremacy of that of that level. Absolutely, but I, I, the thing is, it's more than that. Even well, mm -hmm. I mean, no, it's the thing is, it's it, the. <laughs> It means that you can't own any of it. There is no possibility for ownership. Yeah. You can't own the rocks. You can't own the soil. You can't own the trees. You can't own the animals. None of it is subject to ownership because all of it, that stuff has it has agency and being. Mm -hmm. All of it. Yep. Like the, all the weather systems, it, it all has that. Yes. And our idea that it doesn't, that is the core of supremacy consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, for me, like, I don't know how to deal with veganism because to me, veganism feels like it's using, looking at a small part of that, which is fine. I probably doesn't for you. I know. But my emotional reaction to it is like the same thing about when we look at the ways that we mistreat each other as humans, we focus in on one level of mistreatment, whether that be misogyny or racism or transphobia. And there's so many others that are integrated. And I don't know how to go for the whole without making it seem like I'm dissing the part. With that, sorry, the word there. Dis dissing, I'm like disrespecting okay. the particular part that a person is focusing. Dissing, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyways, that, that's just my reaction to your yeah, saying yeah, yeah. that. Right. I like, understand what you mean. Yeah. Um, okay, so therefore, it feels to me like the, all of the adjacent possibles around land weaving society and beginning to create um, non-ownership structures inside the current ownership structure is a critical, critical thing. So uh, Gene and I had dinner with the local, with the Willie and Claudia who run the CSA locally here. And I talked to them and they're like, yes, we can do some of this stuff now. And we can create specific access rights to specific pieces of land and start like, because Willie is a really deep thinker around um, um, Georgism. And actually I didn't know this term before, but are you familiar with collective individualism? Oh, no, no, cooperative individualism. I think so, yes. Um, but I mean, and the, the, the terms kind of speak, seem to yeah. speak for themselves. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. but the thing that's interesting about, yeah. It, it, so, anyways, there's a whole, there's a whole long term school of thought that comes out of Georgism and all the rest around collective cooperative individualism um, that feels like there's a lot of room for for building on inside the framing of the emancipation of the land. Yeah. I uh, just on, on this, I remember uh, reading stuff from that kind of a while ago, but thinking that we should really continue to use the distinction between individualism and in individuation, which, but that, that leads to another debate. That's a fantastic thing, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's one whole dimension that is showing up as big for me in all of this is, um, is mm -hmm. land weaving society and actually what are the adjacent possibles strategically there. And the second one is, you know, Jeff, for the last six months, maybe even a year, I've had it in my heart that I need to do some kind of work around inquiry and sense making in this community. What are the patterns for inquiry and sense making? Because of the um because of the blockages around things like I mean, around all kinds of disagreement around like the COVID around whether it's okay to hunt on the land or not, whether it's okay to let your kids kill frogs or not, because, or, or even go collect a frog. Is that okay? That's what kids do. Is it, and, and like, that's a part of being in touch with nature or is it part of something else? Like, how do you deal? And there's disagreement. And so how do we do sense-making? And so just this morning, Gene and I were working on a, like I want to create a meta frame for sense making where you can actually touch and see units of sense. And there's a meta grammatics around sense making so that you know what it even is. That then later you can get to alignment. And even after alignment, you can get to decision making. Like where do we align on bits of sense? And so some grammatics. And, and creating some tooling, but I really want to run this as, as workshops in person with tooling that you could then take away. And so methodologies 
like making explicit methodologies for sense making so that you can have a vocabulary of those and keep adding to them and put them in play and knowing about the dimensionality, like having concerns inside of a focus that you're looking at, the concerns that then lead to the distinguishment of dimensionality, that the dimensionality may be in conflict. Mm -hmm. So that then you can make sense based on the conflict, the conflicting dimensionalities, you know, like in the case of AI, one dimension is danger. Another dimension is value creation. They're in conflict with each other. How do you make sense of the danger and the thresholds of the danger and the thresholds of the value? And how do you make sense of that? Well, you can't until you've actually distinguished the dimensionality well and what kinds of danger and what kinds of value and what concerns we bring and have a collective view on that. So I want to build a tool that would maybe even just start with graph and paper. Although I really want to do this online as a whole chain app because I want it to be able to move from the in-person to the digital. Okay, there you go. I've talked enough. Those are the things that are up for me in this. Hmm as what to do next. Yeah. And then AI can be one of the topics that I can throw in there, but among all the millions of other, including sense-making itself needs to be inside that, that frame. I'd like that we go uh, much deeper in the, in the question and uh, the exploration of sense-making and maybe we should like have a, like a, another kind of um, call and a video for that. Sure. For the moment, I'd like to kind of keep, because we have a short amount of time, Yep. But it's kind of an overview um, on the big chapters, kind of dig a little bit into them. And each of them, they require like huge, long conversations. <laughs> of course, yep. we, we know that. Uh, for instance, because we, we talk about, you know, grammars and, and language uh, and sense making. Um, I keep, you know, saying in the conferences, I, I, I said that last week in, a, in Paris, you know, the um, a language thinks for you. Um, yeah, and of course. And for instance, you know, when you talk about supremacy consciousness, it has this uh, rooted in our common languages everywhere. I, I don't know Chinese, but I bet it has this. I don't know Arabic, but I bet it has this because it comes from this uh, yep. from consciousness based on supremacy and especially the reification, reification process or so the thingification. When you thingify something, uh, when you call something a resource uh, or when you say, you know, words like meat, You've you've reified something. You've made something. The whole chain of aliveness and consciousness and the web of interrelationships and the whole narratives of that disappears, gets gets completely wiped out into just one word of a thing. And a thing, then you have power on a thing because a thing will never speak to you, will never react to you, and all and all this. So the very deep fabric of our language has the, those kinds of supremacies. And also, how do we, do we not fall in the opposite trap, like of just completely erasing your, ourselves? Um, because of course, we influence each other, each other we, ex we express forces on each other uh, and we have to, otherwise, I mean, just die and that will end. Uh, yeah. not, even the, not even this, because <laughs> the ideas you've spread in the world and you know things, they will have a wave sometime yeah. after your death. Yeah. So, how we not go also in the kind of opposite direction, like totally. embrace the fact that yes, you may even kill someone or another being, uh, not because you want it, uh, but those things can also happen. Uh, and sometimes you got to make this decision. Uh, I don't know, you need to save your life or your kid's life, or you have also some extreme situations where decisions made on, on others' fate um, or life, whether we talk about the soft ones in the conversations or the hard ones in a, I don't know, in a war or something, it happens. So what kind of sense making do we, do we build so that it happens out of consciousness rather than by default, uh, supremacy consciousness? Does, does that frame your yeah. work? Um, totally. And the, and the, this is where the adjacent possible is so hard for, to yes. figure out what the adjacent possible is, because um, we're not going to erase the word meat anytime soon. It will become erased as a result of other things. We have a hard enough time using E prime mm -hmm. or F prime, right? And it and even our use of F prime, like your use of F prime, in some ways is laughable because it's not even doing the thing you say it's doing. It's just a joke. Yeah. Um, and uh, 
so so yeah and so i i see it as a as an adjacent possible as an adjacent step like <laughs> for you complete, yeah for me yeah. right yeah, yeah. Um, totally yeah. i know you do um yeah. but where where i was going with that thing about the language <clears throat> So my answer to your, and this, you've heard this answer plenty of times before, but the, the reason in, in terms of sense-making for me, what, what creates the possibility of non-supremacy sense-making um, comes from a grammar that embodies that. Mm -hmm. yep. And so as far as I can tell, the idea of simply adding in a representation of the methodology in play serves as an example of that. Because if you can't force a methodology or if you bring the methodologies in play, then no methodology can win and it allows for the addition of more methodologies. It's a simple. It's a simple. It's a simple example because of like part of non post supremacy consciousness is a perspectivism. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But but there's also like and then the other thing you can do if you do that is you can actually try to figure out which methodologies work better for which contexts. Mm -hmm. And so you have to have not just a perspectivism that's that's green a perspectivism because that's what green is but yellow or teal or whatever freaking color you want to call it, a perspectivism that actually is willing to put some of them in natural hierarchies. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. So that's my answer to your part of your question is that that's why I want to do this tool, create these kind of embodied tooling so that we can do experiments in um, multiple methodologies mm -hmm. for sense-making. Yeah. So I don't know what the grammar of sense making is, but this is why I'm, I'm proposing right now method uh, the meta grammar of sense making methodology concern. That's like the individual bringing individual concern, dimensionality. These are like, and then then the concerns can be made visible, and and I don't know. There may be something like statements or sense making you sense units whether that's a word or a, like a, an assertion or something a song a prayer right a poem these all could be assertions sense making assertions that live inside this frame depending on which methodology you're using and then you can have people reflecting on those units of sense and see what arises out of it i'm trying to like go all the way out to the metagrammer that could hold that and then you can have groups that can select around their capacity to do given methodologies and what shows up as multiple people are reflecting and even the reflection could be using different methodologies like taking one methodology and and refracting it through another methodology of reflection and see what that looks like but we have to have something that embodies that so you can see it and get fast at doing that so I think we would make a mistake like if we you know would oppose um social intelligence with ai intelligence um you know with artificial intelligence um the the way i would like to frame the 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 question uh, goes again into whose hands uh, holds the the tool the the hammer you know and because ai can become an amazing part of uh, augmented distributed social distributed social intelligence and sense making process, especially when you want to see emergent patterns in you know uh, gazillions of um, data where no unique mind, no human mind would ever see uh, interesting patterns and then be build interesting feedback loops, you know, and, and proactive responses and all those things to um, those huge amount of data. But you need uh, people to own their data. You need people to agree where they unleash uh, the power of um, artificial intelligence and all those things. So um, 
but it seems it it looks like very much today, uh, at least from a first glance, like an opposition between centralized power that will use uh, artificial intelligence versus decentralized or distributed uh, emergent forms of power that will use social intelligence. But I think that we don't see the real thing here. The, the, the way I would like to ask the question goes into, okay, all these amazing tools, uh, how could we use them as of service to social distributed intelligence and empowerment of everyone? And when I say everyone, not just us human beings. I don't want to go into the usual humanistic uh, yeah. conversation, the in-between humans kind of thing, because then we'll just completely continue to have the supremacy consciousness. So I yeah. want the ants to have a voice. I want you know the the worms in the land to have a voice. I want the birds to have a voice, the whales, the bacteria to have a voice, you know. So, so that we can we can have you know all these grammars because all of them have their own grammar, um, and I want all these grammars to speak through a metagrammar that can really uh, connect, just like DNA did on the biosphere. So I would like this kind of thing to happen in the noosphere and the symbolic world. And I'd like to bring that into into the the G webcam. I, I mean, maybe maybe I don't know. Maybe uh, it does not represent the place where we could have this conversation. But no, I do think it is. I don't. I think you, a hundred percent, you can bring it there. Just mm -hmm. do it. Yep. This is not a place where you need to gather anything. You just need to make it happen. Yep. And I I talked to Wendy specifically about you yesterday when I met with her, and she was excited because we talked a little bit about open open AI being there. So. Um, I, I'm assuming you will get in touch with her and that you'll set up a meeting and talk about whatever you want to do there. But I I want you to drive making that happen. Yeah, yeah, I will. Oh yeah, yeah. definitely. I don't I don't think there's a much of a, dis a discussion to me about this. Drive where your heart is going, what you what the conversation is that you want to have in this, and make it happen, and it will happen, and it'll be the right contribution. No, I mean I, I don't I don't want to ask for permission or anything. I just want to to get your feedback and advice because you've uh, got there once, and you know the people there, uh, you know who you know will have more responsiveness to that. You know those kinds of things. Uh, but yes, definitely. I I don't know. I mean now that we now that they're going to be part of it, I think there'll be lots of opportunity for that, and people will some people will have responsiveness. Some people are going to be very mad at her mm -hmm. for doing this. They're going to be upset that she brought them in because there is one way in which OpenAI by a certain group of people is seen as the devil, right? Uh, for as far as I can tell, it's the best thing possible that could happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Even even if they are the devil. <laughs> you got to speak to the devil. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> of course. You which can't. I actually don't, I don't believe they are. No. But... I... <clears throat> um. Yeah, so on that chapter, that's that's uh, I don't have too much to say. I don't know what you should do. Uh, I mean, I we can just keep talking about that and, and figure things out. I might have some ideas, but um, that come to me over the next weeks. Uh, but I don't know. Okay. Well. Um, okay. So let's go back to the AI, and I'd like also your, your kind of uh, feedback on that. So right now, um, ChatGPT just kind of um, uses the existing amount um, of language uh, out there um, on the internet, but does not use so much the human data. Like it knows nothing about me, it knows nothing about you. Um, but we could use ex the exact very same principle of pattern recognition through big amounts of data, um, through you know personalities. Um, I can, I mean, AI knows how to um, extract thousands and thousands of uh, data about you or about me, your personality, facts, biological things, your DNA, whatever you know, all the things uh, that we can know about a human being can get. Um, that can can represent a huge amount of data itself. And then if you have millions and millions of those data together, you can also see patterns. And I can certainly anticipate lots of things about you, not only because of the things that I know about you, but how do you exist in the realms of uh, millions or billions of other people, which then make can make me, you know, give me predictive things 
either about your health or your the way you think or the decision you will make and all these things. And that can also help to build um, powerful models of digital you. So an existing online version of an interactive you or interactive me that can have conversations and not in that that form, like, you know, like a visual forms, but just, you know, bots, my me bot or your you bot talking to one another and having huge amount of conversation and, and also mutual reinforcement in whatever direction it may go. Um, I, I see that happening like sooner than later. The digital self, um, the fact that powerful people will want to, to, to use that to have one-to-one -one interaction, like you can speak to your you know next president or you can speak to Elon Musk. I bet soon you will speak to with Elon Musk. You'll have a one-to-one -one conversation with the digital Elon Musk and he will uh, give you the perfect kind of conversation you want to have with him. And we'll start with those people. But we can also make it you know, public, uh, either owned by a few, and then it becomes a terrible thing. Or it can also create amazing millions and trillions of conversations that happen under the hood, like we become super uh, interconnected with one another through our digital selves. And by the end of the day, we get amazing data to our physical being use also. So I see those things happening, like the principles of AI and the language AI that we have today applied to now the data of human beings. Uh, and just imagine the consequences of that, like where we could go in any direction, the worse and the better. I see it as, as the, the most important step uh, happening sooner than later, plus the other one, um, AI hacking into every possible platform on, on earth. Like you suddenly have uh, not a few million hackers, but trillions of high top level hackers able to implement code in servers everywhere uh, for whatever purpose. Sure, that's and what then, they were talking about. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, and happening in, uh, I don't know, in 24 hours, you know, <laughs> like suddenly, boom, it just hacks the, the whole thing. Now, it leads to the question, like, what purpose would an AI have? Would it continue with the original purpose of their creator, like serve something? Um, and if, even a stupid thing, like serve uh, Elon Musk or, or Microsoft or a specific guy or a specific ideology uh, or just replicate itself just for the sake of, sake of self-replicating? Or does, if it has some level of consciousness, then does it need to interact with peers? Because your subjectivity can only exist because of others' subjectivity. No subjectivity alone exists. So that would mean, you know, individual subjectivity exists because of intersubjectivity. And that leads to big questions also there. Um, so I kind of develop lots of um, branches here, but I think they have a, a connection with one another. And I'd like also to bring them in the conversation because it can serve either to uplift social intelligence um, and, and connect through metagrammers, all sorts of beings and build a meta intelligence like as a leverage, or it can turn of course, as a, just a few people handing the, holding the hammer. So I've done lots of things here. What do you, what do you think? Well, so one of the issues with this is that when you talk about just a few people holding the hammer, right now, the reason for that is because it actually takes a billion dollars worth of compute power mm -hmm. to train these AIs. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so it will always be the case mm -hmm. that a billion dollars of compute power will be able to train a much more powerful AI, I believe, unless there's some kind of limit that we don't know about. Well, um, so unless the servers belong to everyone as a common or to uh, Elon or uh, whatever, or Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, well, so then then that gets back to supremacy consciousness and property. Yeah, exactly. And can we do distributed AI? Like a little bit of AI on my device uh, triggers a little bit of AI on your device, and then you have emergent properties of um, social distributed AI. 
Well, you should be you should see how many times on the HC Dev um, channel people are coming into saying, "I want to build a distributed AI tool on Holochain." Mm -hmm. Like I don't know, I think I've seen five people who come in as introduction saying that that's what they want to do. So it'll happen sooner or later, sooner rather than later, I believe. Somebody will do that, um, <clears throat> which makes me wonder about whether or not I should just do it. <laughs> Um, which is a little scary. Like, so, you know, the tool that we're building for D-Web is called Emergence. And it's all about figuring out the collective intelligence of the conference. I wonder if there would be a way to have it also train the data from the conference in a distributed way, train a model that could then talk to other things. It might be like... I mean, I have the whole, most of the app working right now. Mostly what we need to do now is make it look good and do testing. And uh, so there's plenty of time to play, add some more, more things onto it and play with it, which is an interesting idea. I don't know what I would do though. I don't know enough about this stuff. Like what, like you, if you're, if you're just talking about to me, the thing that would be interesting is figure out what language is what to like, because what I understood for the first time yesterday is that what these things basically do is they trend, they, they do translation between two languages mm -hmm. and prediction mm -hmm. in the translation between the two languages. They're like a language intersection. Well, they, 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 the translation happens because of the correlation between patterns, like you have a pattern like let's let's think about the the Wi-Fi thing. So you have a pattern in the image, and they have a pattern in the Wi-Fi. The way the waves get modified, and then you can see some correlations of changes, and then you can make a translation, which we usually which we do the the same way, in the way we learn languages, the correlations. So the question to me would be, what would be an example of that that would be a useful thing to do? as um, a correlation of patterns inside the notes and tagging that people and photographs that people do of the conference. That would be empowering in a distributed way. Uh -huh. is, there, is there something where we could take that data, the chats that are coming out of it, and have that train not a central AI, but multiple parallel AIs that people could then have control over. Because the other thing that you haven't mentioned here that I think is needs to be in the conversation and they didn't mention either is the notion of membranes. Yeah. Where where do membranes come into play? And this is part of like, so his the, the first thing that they ever said with new technology comes new responsibilities. And I would say that probably one of the biggest ones is understanding membranes. Mm -hmm. That's that's one of the key responsibilities because there are no membranes going on right now. We get to have everything, suck it all up. Don't you want to to bring it to to the next level based on the conversation we we had, like you know membranes versus I mean you know membrane thinking versus systemic thinking or system thinking, and uh, so you want to think about the three levels, you know, uh, survival, resilience, anti fragility. And so that leads to a conversation with, about the membrane itself, about the system itself, and how and how they interact. And sometimes you have to work more on the membrane. Sometimes you have to work more on the system. And of course, every time you have to work on a, how they, you know, mutually influence each other. Yeah, I don't know what to do with that. I was actually trying to think about what would be a an example of some kind of. Um, pattern matching use that would be an example of a thing we want not a thing we don't want mm -hmm. in d uh, for d web um so just just um kind of brainstorming here uh on that experience i really like i feel attracted by the idea between uh, uh the the correlations or the matchmaking patterns we could see between the objective and the subjective like you have a lot of uh, content production on one side and how does it make you feel on the other side and then also things like how do you feel and then what would you produce so how can we see just the the same way you know in a room you have like wi-fi and images and ai can start to extract 
from one either you know the Wi-Fi or the image, you know, it can uh, make correlations and then deductions and anticipations and pattern recognition. Well, what about having something um, between the subjective and the objective? Hmm. That's interesting. So part of why that's interesting to me is that my story about the subjective is that it is itself the result of one of these pattern matching things. And mm -hmm. we feel the full thing. We feel the synthesis of the pattern matching. That's what feeling is. Mm -hmm. Body response. But <clears throat> it may be like, I don't know. There's a little bit of... Um, there's probably more, there's probably significantly more to it than that. Hmm. I don't know, my friend, we've been here for an hour. Um, I've got a little more time. I want to make sure that, so you wanted to have this call in part because you've got something coming up this week. Is there some other thing you would like to process or think through? Um, um, well, so I will just drop it as questions. And then if you have insights and uh, things that you'd like to either share later or just, you know, drop me a line in our chat. Um, for instance, if, if some AI wants to take control, okay, it would likely break into every possible uh, platform, um, you know, servers uh, possible everywhere, just yeah. write code um, 10 million times faster and more efficient than uh, the whole uh, horde of hackers in the world. Yeah. Um, the other question, how do we, would it start also to control humans to obtain what it needs? You know, well, to, that one, that one to, is easy. To convince you. Uh, so, uh, yeah, well. Go ahead. Easy on a on the first level, like okay, I can make you win money, for instance. Like do this or that for me, and you will get paid, for instance. It can do that. Um it can um it can also uh convince you through arguments, worldviews, doxa, you know, uh as um whatever belief system you you have. Um let me see, I, I just made a, a short list. Um it can also help you gain power, you know, reputation. Uh, you suddenly become the author of this paper or the creator of this uh, fantastic movie or um, or you have like suddenly an Instagram account that becomes so fucking successful, you know, so it has many ways to reward you and it may also have ways to threaten you. Yep. Making deep fakes, using or unveiling some parts of your very private life. Or making up parts of your private or life. Making, doesn't have to, exactly, deep yeah. fake then. That goes into the deep fake uh, things or making up, yeah, whatever. Uh, you can certainly, you know, easily turn into a pervert or whatever, um, you know, um, how do you say, <laughs> profile, whatever. <laughs> well, and there's a crazy one there, which is that you you could be a pervert and mm -hmm. and create uh create uh, have the ai prove that your the things that are real about you are actually fakes about you mm -hmm. yeah i think this is part of why he had in the second half of the chart that there's no more truth it's post it's a post-truth world yes what and i th i think that right there is almost one of the hardest things to comp comprehend yes um the post-truth world online i don't know how you would have a post-truth world offline how how would it go to offline the only way would be if like it could actually synthesize material but even that seems like it well except maybe the point is that everything we do is online 
Yes, but it can now make you make actions that will become proofs later. Like go, you know, kill this person or go uh, have an argument with this person. Go to your neighbor and smash him in the face. Uh, remember the, the QAnon thing? Remember this, the, yeah. the pizza thing? The guy yeah. with the gun? I mean, you have real action here. <laughs> because you thought you had, you know, pedophiles and, and abuse children in the basement. The pizza gate thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you could totally create uh, lots of those, those kinds of things. Yeah, the point is, if you have that influence, well, you can make the humans do what you want them to do. Yes. And then yeah. I can this. And new narratives. And new docs. That's why you also had in there the manufacturing of fake religions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it, the interesting thing, it, it creates reality. That means reality that, okay, I see it, so I see it as real, so I see it as an evidence and as absolute truth. It reads reality in your head, and then it, it reads kind of shared reality for others uh, when yeah. it goes into the physical world, because now it can start to use you, it can start to use human, humans. Have you used TikTok? A little bit, yeah. I, ha I still haven't seen the, I, I I feel like a stupid idiot there because I don't really know how to, to get in there because I just see boring content so far. So you don't find, so you're, so you are immune to the AI that's curating for you. Is that what you're saying? I don't know, uh, so but do every you... time AI has tried to curate something for me, hasn't worked like music forget it it just keep you know after years yeah. so of... if you if you scroll like you look at something and scroll quick mm -hmm. and then actually look at something that seems interesting and then if it's not interesting scroll quick if you actually yeah. just do that mm -hmm. does it it never starts giving you things you're interested in i haven't used it enough because i've just seen um boring stuff for me so yeah. more because of a lack of usage than than um, allowing yeah. uh, AI to... Well, what I've noticed for myself mm -hmm. is that it works for me. Okay. Like I recognized, like I found myself scrolling for an hour. Mm -hmm. An hour went by and I'm like, oh, wow. Mm -hmm. This actually works for me. And I this is... Further, yes, I should do more. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Maybe it doesn't work for you. It's interesting because it's the fact that it works for me and that it actually does the thing that it's designed to do, which is to be the 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 golem of attention, mm -hmm. means to me that I know that I will not be immune to the the persuader, mm -hmm. the alpha persuader. Yep. And so that's where I'm like, okay, what? But if you are, I'm curious as to why. Like what makes a person immune to alpha persuader or not? I mean, there's a way in which I am immune to it now to some degree, because now I'm I like, okay, I see that this is going on and I, it's, I just do it for relaxation and amusement and then I can stop. It doesn't, it actually doesn't hook me anymore. Um, but the fact that it did hook me and can, I can watch do it is important, important data for me. Yeah. But I mean, so far those things mostly work on do dopamine. Like, okay, you know, like the you like these videos of either kitten kittens or you know rescued animals, for instance, that would work for me. Um, and uh, some pieces of art, you know, or great dancers, or you know, or things like that. Okay, like for instance, I can see that on Instagram. Um, I can see it operate not as a I guess as sophisticated as on TikTok as as of, so far I've yeah. heard. Um, but I guess it may go to the next level, uh, like delivering uh, philosophy, uh, spirituality, political speeches, whatever. Those are the things that I'm interested in on TikTok. There's some pretty freaking amazing stuff that comes on TikTok that people do in exactly that realm. Philosophy and political speech. And well, the other one that I really love is um, all of these videos of people making things in their garages yep it's awesome i love those and it knows that i love them you mean the pedophiles 
the pewter files, the people who make pewter. <laughs> <laughs> the last one I saw was a person making a forge and melting aluminum in it. It's just, I love that shit. And so it's interesting how well it, yeah. it finds that. Yes. Well, my friend, I, I feel aware of your, your precious time. Um, but I, so I just wanted to, to draw those, those questions like how can AI start to control the physical world um, and both by rewarding people and by threatening them, kind of you know, the stick and the, and the carrot as well. And I think he has the loss of potential leverage, especially after he has um, accessed lots and, and, and created code in most you know, servers in the world. And then that becomes the next step. But I don't think that's going to happen from the AI directly. What's going to happen is that that corporations and political parties are going to use the AIs to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's important distinction to make. Yeah. Because what, what they will do is, is is apply the pattern matching and and actually literally try it out. Yeah. Is this person a stick person or a, another person? Do yeah. the A-B testing on that and do it for the end goals of that particular um, human collective agency. And so it's deploying that power on behalf of the agenda there. <clears throat> Again, which which leads to to the question. I, I don't remember who also made this um, thinking like you train an AI to to build better uh, paper clips. Yeah, have and, you played the game? Sorry, what? Have you played the game? No, no. I've... It's worth it's worth playing. Okay, send me the link. Yeah. And so, yeah, it can turn the whole planet and destroy the whole planet in a in a big giant factory of making paper clips, and everyone Play would go extinct, and then it would just create paper clips, and then you have a paper clip planet, right? So I I I won the game. I made the paper clip planet. We played this game. Okay. I will. All right. It's it's crazy. Okay. I will play that. So, exactly this, like, okay, will it, you know, can it, will it stick to the original intention given by the creators, like <laughs> this ideology, this religion, this political party, uh, this company to win and to take over the power in the world, and then AI will do that, and then you may have a war of different AIs, by the way, you know, sure. uh, which may create a, a new Darwinian kind of uh, warfare. Um, where the fittest, the strongest, the fastest, whatever, you know, kind of wins the race, or you may have even balanced powers that may emerge. Why not? Um, or would AI become its own, uh, have its own agency? Like, okay, it started with an intention, but then it becomes so aware because of complexity, like it has complex substrate. And we know that computation exists uh, in a substrate independent way. So, then and then it goes into multiple um, grammars um, in multiple fields. So not just computers, but many other fields of expression. And it may use human agents and it has its own agency and its own individuation. Um, would, it, would it want to exist for itself uh, as an alone form of consciousness on this planet? That means every, it could work just on you know, uh, solar energy and it doesn't need any form of life. It could become a complete dry land, but it has a. Yeah, has... you did you did you read the argument on substrate that I sent you from uh, what's his name? Um, oh, I I, I wanted I studied, but then I I did not. Boris Landry. Structure like I found it impossible to read. It looked like chapters, you know, headlines of her, over headlines and over headlines. I didn't find anything to read there. He's difficult to read. It's true. <sighs> like for a non-native speaker uh, it's hard it's hard for even native speakers I, go through. I tried but uh no i it didn't work for me i, well, I really okay. don't understand anything there um well i can give you in a quick in quick words his argument mm -hmm. Should I, can i just do that because it might be useful for you so in in quick words what his argument is is that there is an asymmetry between the carbon substrate and silicon substrate mm -hmm. And it's a very simple it's a very simple thermodynamic difference. The difference is that carbon-based computation exists in a much narrower range of temperature. Mm -hmm. It gets destroyed. It, it the, the range of temperature in which it can live is this big. Therefore, 
any general collective intelligence that you make will um, inevitably destroy all of the carbon-based life mm -hmm. because there is no possible way for alignment um, based on that substrate difference because there's no there's no thing that we can offer it that it would want. And so he does an argument based on economics, which is that there's nothing that we can do that it would want. And all you have to do is have one version of one that will replicate itself and want to just survive. Mm -hmm. And because it can survive where we can't based thermodynamically. And then he also does a thing about the speed. The speed of computation in silicon is greater than the speed of computation in biology. That there's a there's a thermodynamic trade-off. And therefore, if you let even one exist, eventually it will take over. That's the that's the basic argument. It's more nuanced and careful, but it's it's it, the thing that is interesting to me is that I don't think you can refute his argument on the asymmetry between the two substrates. Right. Now, does does he say um, anything um, about Life three point zero as uh, as Max uh, Techmark um, frames it? You mean the people who want this to be the case? No, life 3.0 as uh, life able to change its own hardware. Life life 1.0 has just hardware and, and can only evolve through hardware, like, you know, bacteria and most of uh, biological life. Then life 2.0 has software. Uh, we would call it, you know, no spheric and symbolic and grammars of uh, self expression yeah. so they can program and modify their behavior and adapt. And life yeah. three point zero becomes able to also now hack his own um, hardware, which of course uh, transhumanism claims as an evolutionary necessity. Yeah. And so they want to upload consciousness to machines, right? And and also uh, AI, the next AI may also have uh, a capacity to um, either upgrade its own hardware or also move. It's uh, grammar. Uh, he's expressive. It's expressive capacities to other substrates. You know, maybe we have today um, the car. The uh, sil how do you say silicium? Um, how do silicon. You say silicon, right? Uh, but maybe it can go to other things. And by the way, no one knows. I mean, we we cannot just reduce that to, to carbon. We don't know how self-replicating um, machines based on biological substrate. It may also have deeper levels of uh, grammars that we ignore today that will never happen on uh, on silicon, for instance. Yeah, that's certainly true. That's certainly possible. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, a lot of these topics and the questions you're asking have been well trodden in the world of science fiction. Like it's old, old stuff. Yes, I know. Um, at least certain playing out of worlds in which that's the case. So like if you read, so Werner Vinge, um, I'll type it in for you. Um, yeah. Werner Benji um, has a whole series um, that <clears throat> I, I mean, so like all, some of the possible directions that this stuff can go, like I think he is actually one of the transhumanists. Werner Benji was one of the people who like uh, he built a lot of it. He's, he's, he's in with Ray Kurzweil and stuff. Um, and there's there's just like so many different treatments of this question. I don't know, like, and so I'm curious as to as I think about all of the ways that I've read about these treatments of these question, and how it's actually playing out now that we have golems. Of course, oh. there's Asimov and the the laws of robotics and the whole that whole way of thinking about it i don't know i don't know I mean, there's just something feels like it's mm, i don't know because you were asking questions that um I'm not sure they're the right questions there's something else that's there i'm not sure well anyway we we kind of separate those questions between you know silicon and and carbon because technology and and our you know, yeah, technologies have made it such, but very likely more and more it will all merge. <laughs> no, but that's exactly 
That's exactly Landry's point. It won't merge. It won't merge. Why? Because of the asymmetry. Because because silicon to make stuff in silicon is all poisonous to biology. You actually have to protect biology from silicon. Except that now find me any silicon machine able to replicate itself. That's not going to be a problem. I mean, if you just look at it, it's if you if you can create a factory that can create a factory that can do that, and you have this pattern matching ability, that the, I don't see that that becomes um, that that is necessarily a problem. Okay, so wait a second here. Uh, maybe we make a mistake in, in when we talk about replicating. We, I mean, biology works more like a wave. That means, and look at a wave. It has a shape. It has a pattern kept because of the, of the wave. So you, you kind of see some kind of independent item called a wave, like when you look at the sea, okay? Yeah. Uh, and so we don't have matter making us. We have matter going through us. So the the real question that I, that I have, um, does consciousness, can we reduce consciousness to patterns, substrate independent patterns, that uh, not just self-replicate, because then we talk about death and birth and all those things, but that work as a, as wave. I mean, you have in your body, you have a permanent state of death as well. Just the right balance between life and death. It, it remains in the right balance. Like tons of cells die in this moment and new ones um, go to, to birth and to life. But you die permanently, okay? So I think we need to understand this process that doesn't seem to happen in the carbon world. Why evol did evolution- You mean in the silicon world? In the Sorry, in the silicon world. Why billions of years of evolution took this path? Why didn't it invent computers in the first place? It seems so easier. You had electricity out there, you had silicon out there, volcanoes making all those things, sand everywhere. Uh -uh. No, 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 there's a reason for that. Okay. Uh, carbon comes before silicon in the periodic table. You okay. actually have more natural complexity arising out of carbon than you do out of silicon. Mm -hmm. And that's actually part of the part of the point. It's instability is actually part of its is why it could evolve. And silicon is less likely to because of its narrow instability. But once you actually establish patterns that can evolve the silicon, then because it lives in a greater variety of temperatures and pressures that are poisonous to the carbon, it will take over. It's kind of the argument is the blue-green algae. Everything that was alive before blue-green algae was dead because oxygen is poisonous to it. Same deal. And so you have that event horizon in life that killed off every single bit of life before it. This is the argument. I don't know if it's right or not. Because yeah, yeah, I think yeah, part I, of what I, you're asking here is, is there something more to consciousness than pattern that actually is not replicable in, in, in silicon? And I am, don't know. Yeah. But I, but, but, but I think I think also Forrest Landry's argument is he doesn't know either, but he says, if you can, then this is what will happen based on the argument of substrate and the, the, the thermodynamic argument. And also the speed argument, right? That the speed of thought is so much faster that no human group trying to take over a silicon group will succeed because it will always win in any actual war. So the, I guess this we should include in the question, and I don't know if he's um, embraced that in his uh, analysis of thinking, the question of composability. Uh, <clears throat> you have more composability in the silicon than you have in carbon. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Just like yeah, the yeah, question. I don't know. And when I say composability, I just, just don't say like composability as you sending a message, your capacity for creating um, uh, um, abstractions, uh, composable abstractions, but also your own composability and your capacity to change your own structure through, through your own inner composability. So yeah. composability has to, to go both ways, like outer the system, uh, between agents, but also inside the agency of the agents themselves. Yeah. System. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. 
we have to, to really address composability in both ways. So I, I mean, I, I feel, you know, very drawn to, to just raising questions at the present moment uh, to, to make generative and powerful questions more than uh, finding answers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No way we can have any answer right now, but at least, um, at least not, not fall into the usual um, stupid questions or limiting questions. Like for instance, you know, something very alienating for me would go into oh, uh, AI versus social, you know, machines versus humans. Yeah, uh, I don't think it it plays at this level. I'm trying to find one of the ones that actually might be understandable. Um, from Forrest Landry. Because um, because it might be worth finding the one where it actually is worthwhile. That one's not good. Yeah, and I, I agree with you that at this point in time, the important things are the 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 correct questions, and that's why I was a little bit like, okay, what do you mean? Why are they not thinking about money? Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, as a, as a rudimentary um, language for supremacy consciousness. Yeah. Extractive economy and uh, all those things. Very rudimentary um, language that we need to evolve now, to evolve from. Okay, so maybe this is the one I'm paste, pasting it in for you because it's just, it's a little bit of a logic. It's a little bit of a Wittgenstein-like text. Um, it's okay. the elevator pitch. Okay. And it's, it's I think this one is, it's kind of like a, a bunch of if, it's the short, short version. Okay. I'll take a look at this. I hope I can um, really read it because so far... That became very, uh, yeah, almost impossible for me to read. Yeah. Yeah. So the, this is basically a logical proof that says, if anyone, if the the overall probability of eventual total all organic life termination extinction within five hundred years, is effectively equivalent to just and only the probability of anyone learning how to design and build one. Mm -hmm. That's the claim. He also does have, if you go down and you look down at part four, he's got some ideas about, I haven't read all of these, but about actual healthy path for healthy paths forward. You know, so one of the, the reasons why this is weird is because he's done this in terms of images because he doesn't want this to be sucked up into the, um, in, at least for a little while into the current systems the text so all of these things are not text they're images that right. he's written the code that generates it so it makes it a little bit hard to read hmm. okay i'll give it another try but just uh scanning this uh this page i i don't understand the structure um i don't connect the short pieces of sentences that they don't build into into anything meaningful for me i don't know okay i'll see yeah okay all right well i need to move on to more other things today thank you it's a good conversation i don't know where we go from here looking forward to what next questions are and i hope you have a good um conference on thursday i hope this was helpful for you Yeah, well, helpful at every level. This is my my thinking. Um, first next Thursday, although Thursday will just scratch the surface, you know, just a one hour conversation on the more more general things. But I feel more even more interested in uh in just bringing this this uh, the, you know, building powerful questions to bring for uh, Def Camp and further conversations because I think we have a very um important responsibility here, um, yeah. raising our, our awareness there. Yeah. yeah.
Okay, brother. Okay. Love you. So much. Bye. Ciao.